21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskarik. Psychological safety has been thrown around a lot in business writing lately. We hear a lot about it, and it seems like a very academic term and kind of geeky in many ways. Caroline and I really like to bring it down to this deeply human feeling and experience. Because all of us, whether we know the term or not, have experienced having psychological safety in some settings and not having it in others. And so I want to talk about what it feels like first. And what it feels like when you're in an environment that is psychologically safe is that you feel and you believe that you can speak up, you can challenge someone else's point of view, you can ask a question, you can make a mistake, and you can show up pretty much as yourself. without the fear of embarrassment or humiliation or exclusion. And when you don't have it, conversely, it feels pretty terrible because you fear, feel like you don't dare speak up even if you do have a different point of view and you don't dare challenge and you even mask who you are because you don't want to stand out and you don't want to be singled out for embarrassment or exclusion. So that's how we think about it. It's this deeply human need and a feeling and it's so great when we have it and it's so awful when we don't. During my uh, time with McKinsey, I've been uh, for a long time um, top management consultant with McKinsey. I've experienced many different teams in different client organizations in different countries. And um, the feeling being on a team was quite different from team to team. And now that I know, know the term psychological safety, I know why. that time back I didn't know that and I remember once um, I mean in within McKinsey there's the culture obligation to dissent and normally this is working well and um, very young associates and consultants discuss openly with um, those upper in the hierarchy however this doesn't always happen um, it's also depending on the leader and which um, climate um, the leader is creating. And I remember one team where the director was really creating kind of a freezing environment. And everyone felt awful, <laughs> including myself. And we had a young, um, very bright fellow on the team. Um, and it turned out he didn't dare to speak up with a very crucial insight. And because he didn't speak up, we wasted weeks running in the wrong direction. We did a lot of analysis and a lot, a lot of work, hard work. And later it turned out, oh, this was completely wrong. And this fellow knew some crucial element, but he didn't dare to bring it at the table. So I have this experience, how it feels to be part of um, teams where psychological safety was present and where it was missing. It sounds so simple. 
So you don't dare embarrassment, freezing environment, uh, wasting weeks versus asking questions. So why is it so hard just to ask questions and to save a lot of money and stress? Well, it sounds really simple when you say it that way. And it also sounds very obvious, like, of course, we want an environment like this. But I will tell you, you know, I spent 30 years in the tech industry and I would say that it is rarer than it is common. And I think the why behind that is people in leadership roles don't have the skills to create the environment that they need to, because there are actual skills that you need to put into practice to create an environment where people speak up and where everyone has a voice at the table. And you know that's what led us to, to meet and do the work that we do together, because it's this lack of leadership know-how in what does it take to create a psychologically safe environment for everyone to, to thrive. And it's maybe not obvious. It's maybe not as obvious as it sounds. From a biologist perspective, it's clear that psychological safety is not the default. It's not what happens automatically, naturally. We really need to deliberately cultivate it because it often goes against what we naturally tend to do or what we um, are trained to do. So we really need to um, foster this deliberate practice. So I left the tech industry after 30 years in 2019. And the reason I left is honestly connected to the work that I'm doing now. It informed what I'm doing now because after having a great career, it was made clear to me that I was no longer welcome and that it was time for me to leave. And so, you know, that was a bit of a shock to the system because I'd always worked inside a company and I didn't know if I could start my own thing. I felt I was not in any way entrepreneurial, but I also realized I don't wanna work for anybody else. And so I have to start my own thing. And when I decided to do that in 2020, it was crystal clear for me where I wanted to focus my energy in this phase of my career. And that was in helping leaders become more inclusive and create the conditions for everyone to do their best work with a really strong foundation of psychological safety. Because I so often found that lacking in tech. And also, even though I was in a leadership position for like 20 of those 30 years, I was never trained in these things. I picked up skills here and there. I would read, I would take a class here and there, but I really didn't feel that I had been given adequate adequate training. I was just thrown into management. And that's often how so many people come to be managers. They're really good at what they do and they get promoted or they're really good at what they do and they start their own business, right? And they're passionate about something, but they don't have leadership skills. And I feel like now after having done it so long, you know, in the trenches that I could help other leaders do better and learn these skills. They're not, it's not black magic. They really are learnable, teachable skills. And so that's where I decided to focus, focus my energies. And I, and I just started my business, you know, a little over two years ago, really. In a way, quite a similar um, situation. Um, I'm also a um, self-employed leadership consultant, independent. Um, and I came to this um, topic, uh, psychological safety, because it's so fundamental for teams to really be um, successful. Um, however, my way um, to the position where I am now was a little bit different from Mines. Um, my background is in science um, with a PhD in human genetics, and I was always interested in how do humans function. So I really wanted to understand um, how do humans behave? Why do they do what they do and so on? And what are the fundamentals behind? Um, and um, after my, or during McKinsey, I more and more realized that what is at the core of leadership is being human and relating to others in a human way. Um, and I wanted to um, focus really on 
supporting, enabling, empowering leaders to be more effective leaders. So I wanted to move away from the more analytical stuff uh, I did with McKinsey and really focus on, on this, um, these fundamental leadership skills. And, and I think this is really an optimistic message we'd like to um, bring across to, to, to the audience. These are all skills that can be learned. Men, Minette mentioned that. It's not um, that, um, like with blue eyes, for example, that you have it or you don't. No, it's something we all have the capacity for and we can get better and train it. And in our book, we share very simple actions and things and, and everyday steps we can take to do exactly this, get better in um, vital leadership skills. Caroline and I met in an online class in the spring of 2021. It was a class in running psychological safety assessments. And it was based on the work of Amy Edmondson, who's a well-known Harvard researcher who specializes in research on psychological safety. So we were learning to do these assessments and Caroline and I were in a small group within the class together. And I was actually on a podcast with another one of the students, a leadership podcast. And in that podcast, I was talking about my views on leadership. And I also said, you know, there's all this academic research about psychological safety, but there seems to be very little practical information for leaders who want to dive in and implement a more psychologically safe environment. So I said that on the podcast. And then the very interesting thing happened is that Caroline tuned into that podcast, even though she says she never listens to podcasts. And I'm going to let her tell the rest of the story. Yeah, exactly. And I can absolutely remember that evening um, while preparing dinner for the family. I listened to the podcast, which I <laughs> never do. And I hardly could finish um, preparing the dinner because I had to stop so often and take notes because what Minette shared was exactly um, along the lines I was thinking. Very tangible things leaders can do. And I always felt this is kind of missing. I wanted to, pr to provide my clients with material. What is it that they can do? And there was kind of a gap, um, not really um, covering the how of psychological safety. And I found it so fantastic that Minette was um, thinking in exactly the same way that I, I immediately sent an email to Minette and subject line crazy idea. <laughs> and my crazy idea was the suggestion to develop this missing material um, ourselves. So why don't we put our experience, our hearts, our brains together and create what we are missing for our clients? And that's what we do. And that's what we did. And actually, um, our Miro board and, um, is still, um, the name is still Crazy Idea. <laughs> so um, I'm glad uh, I reached out with this um, a, a little bit unusual email and uh, I got an immediate response from Minette, and that was the start of our fantastic collaboration. One of the things that was so cool about that email was that I didn't hesitate. There was something in her email that was just like, what if we did this crazy idea? And I immediately said yes. There was not any hesitation on my part. And I wrote back and said yes. And, and we just basically got on a Zoom call and we started brainstorming on this online Miro board that Caroline set up. And that has been the nature of our collaboration throughout. Now it's been two years since we first met of what if, what if we tried this? What if we first, it started like, what if we wrote a pamphlet that we were going to give out to our clients and it turned into, 
What if we actually self-publish this? And then it turned into, what if we found a publisher? And all of this is through experimentation and just being open to new ideas and things that might fail and some things that might continue and putting all of our ideas out there. Some of them made it into the book. Some of them didn't. Some of them are in our, what we call the simmering pot for future reference. But it was all very lighthearted. And, you know, I think that is part of our, our secret to success is that we didn't take ourselves too seriously. We took it as experimentation and trying things and seeing what worked and learning from what didn't and keeping this, you know, environment that we created ourselves for the two of us that is incredibly psychologically safe where we throw out all of our wild ideas and we can debate and we cannot agree. And we always enjoy working together because we just want to do something wonderful together. And so I think that's been the magic that we've created together. So uh, Caroline, you reached out, so you felt something and you reached out. Then Minette, you were asking questions such as what if both of you did experimentation and you stressed out the importance of the context or okay, the environment. I suppose those are some of the practical tips and probably strategies mentioned in your book. Could you tell us more about some of them and how can team leaders use the book to, let's say, foster psychological safety in their teams? A little bit in, in our story is um, is related to um, to some of the actions we we um, um, describe and explore in the book. So, for example, embracing risk and failure. So, what if? And then, with an openness and curiosity, and not not letting the fear of failure stop you stop you from 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 doing what you want to do. So, embracing risk and failure. And do it in a lighthearted way and frame it as experiment and not, we didn't frame it as now we want to publish a very serious book and so on. No, we we thought step by step, we did iterations, we uh, thought about what would be minimum viable product. And we thought maybe a little down, free downloadable thing on a website, something like that. So step by step experimenting, not letting fear of failure stop you. And also openness, transparency, always um, assuming, I don't know, assuming the best from the other person, assuming good intent. Um, all these are kind of themes which you can find in our book too. I'll call out one more, which is that um, I think was so key and it's in our book and it's about listening and really listening with an open mind and an open heart without getting defensive. And so when you're co-creating work, it can be very vulnerable, right? I'm writing something, Caroline's writing something, we're sharing it with one another. And we were both just in this space of, I want this to be as good as it can be. I'm not going to get defensive. I'm not going to get overly attached to my own views on this. I want to truly listen. And I found myself, I think it was a great exercise for me and, and maybe too for you, Colleen. There were times when I felt myself naturally thinking, no, like I'm putting up my defenses. I don't agree with this. And that was my instinct. But then I put into practice what we say in our book. I was like, pause take a breath, listen, listen to understand, ask a clarifying question. These are some of the tips we give to leaders. And I practiced that myself. And I often found I was open to changing my mind when I did that because Caroline had a better idea. Even if I initially got defensive, I'm like, okay, this makes sense. Or I could debate if I really didn't agree and Caroline would listen. So I think this is what we put into practice. And it's exactly what we ask leaders to try in our book. So regarding the process, was it uh, the so from MVP from minimum valuable product to to final product, and uh, in the context of listening, you, Caroline, spoke be, be, before we we formally started uh, with the interview about LinkedIn. How did you communicate? What was the process from minimum valuable product to to the final product? What I experienced, there was a lot of interaction between both two of you, but also between two of you and the rest of the world, or what was, or some specific target audience, or 
what was the process like? Um, both of us as um, independent leadership consultants, um, we were already doing a lot of work around psychological safety with clients. So we did know what is situation, what are the needs, what are the challenges and so on. And these kind of projects, conversations, also interaction on LinkedIn um, continued, of course, all the time. It was kind of parallel. And at the same time, we went step by step in iterations. And um, I don't know, it, it was only beginning of uh, last year that we considered, oh, this could really be a published book because first of all, we assumed that such a short book wouldn't be interesting for a publisher. So it was not, not that we, from the beginning on, um, aimed very high and then maybe we're blocked about, oh, oh my goodness, this feels so um, unfeasible and um, fear of failure is higher, of course, when you aim high. So we always kind of, um, what was your expression, Minette? You had a, a fantastic expression, the less ambitious product or something, right? Yeah, I can't remember, but like a, a very unambitious project. And um, we we just kept exceeding expectations along the way because, yeah, we really, you know, our book is quite short and we wanted it by design to be quite short. But we also know most business books are not that short and that publishers wouldn't be interested. So we were, we were going down this path, as Caroline said, of first a free download on our website and then maybe just a self-published short book. And the way that came to change is that uh, I was speaking to the head of talent at the speaking bureau where I'm represented, the Lavin Agency. And Charles Yao, this really great guy, said, you know, when's your book coming out? And I said, well, I wrote this little short thing with Caroline and we don't know what to do with it. And he introduced us to our publisher. He said, wait, hold on. <laughs> In his expression, he said, friends don't let friends self-publish. And he said, uh, you need to meet this wonderful publisher, page two. And he introduced us to Jesse Finkelstein. And that's how we got hooked up with our publisher but again we weren't even looking for a publisher it just happened to be through talking to people and introductions and you know having low expectations so that's sort of how it happened and then now you know on the other hand we switched because then when we did have a publisher we suddenly understood this is a real book and because it's a real book and we care so deeply about this material we wanted to reach a broad audience. So now we've been doing a lot of work and doing podcasts and writing articles and publishing a lot on LinkedIn because we believe so much in the work and we feel like the only way we change the world of work and the workplace is by finding an audience for this book. And so now we become much more proactive, I would say, in really trying to spread the word about the book. Yeah, exactly. And now it's it's much bigger. However, maybe the message also for, for those who are entrepreneurs, it's so powerful if you do simple steps. What's the um the the most feasible, the tiniest next step you can take? Um, what's the minimum viable product which is with, within reach? So not letting yourself go in this direction, um, thinking too big and then acting too small, but um, really um, thinking about very tiny steps and from tiny steps can grow something very big. And so once we realized that we have a real book that's being published by a publisher and is going out into the world, you know, one of the things that we learned is that it's it's really important to get endorsements for your book from other experts in the field. And the first person we thought of when we were going to put this book out is Amy Edmondson, because she is considered the authority on psychological safety. And so we reached out to her with an early draft of the book back in the fall of, of 2021, and she was willing to read it. And she gave us such positive feedback. And she even said, like, I feel like you're closing the gap between my research and you as practitioners out in the world so that it's filling this gap. 
And she gave us an endorsement for the book. And I think that gave us a little bit of confidence to reach out to some big names of writers and experts in the field. And we got fabulous endorsements on our book. And now we're starting to see now that the book's been out for three weeks, we are seeing, you know, almost 100 reviews in the US and there's 50 in Germany and on many of the other sites, what people are saying, and Caroline, I'm really, you'll have to chime in with what you're seeing on the German site too, but what the theme seems to be is that people are finding this book truly, truly useful and that it's short, it's actionable, even experts. I just saw a review that arrived today in the US site that said, uh, it's from an HR person who said, I thought I really knew everything there was to know, but I learned new things that I put into practice immediately. So it's not the idea of we're learning academic concepts, it's that we're learning something we're putting into action every day. And seeing those reviews is so powerful. We we heard a, a, from a stranger on LinkedIn this week, someone we'd never heard of before, she heard of our book and she was already running a workshop based on the materials in it. So we saw that post. It was like such a delightful thing, a, a picture with post-its and they were working on the materials in our book. So that's what we're finding. And it's exactly what we were hoping for because we wanted to create this useful guide. And this is what's um, delighting us the most that our audience um, who are really the leaders in organizations, in companies who are um, doing the, they are facing real challenges. They are working in teams and real teams and so on. It's not academia. It's really the down to earth day-to-day -day business and they find it useful. And therefore I also, I'm so amazed um, by the endorsements, for example, Oliver Herrmann from Deutsche um, Telekom um, who gave a great um, endorsement um, um, they are really driving forward new ways of working together. And it's lovely to see that those practitioners who are doing actually the work are loving the book. And I also personally, I, I really enjoy that people like the whimsical figures, which I drew <laughs> to illustrate our book and to make it even more tangible and lighthearted. And um Minette, you talking about um, someone using this as a material. I heard this in Germany too. Um, someone um, uh, from a big company, a big insurance company used um, material from our book to give a keynote to all the Asian leaders. So obviously it's very, um, very applicable and very, um, very ready to use material what we pro provided. If you understand a little bit um, one basic um, feature of the brain, which is really crucial to understand in this context is that kind of the, the brain has kind of two modes. One is exploration and one is defense. And when you are in stress and you experience stress, um, you can't be curious. You, you are not in exploration mode, you are in defense mode. So for anyone who wants to be creative, innovative, things like that, you kind of need to um, keep your brain in exploration mode. And, 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 and stress is really, um, uh, it's a killer for, for innovation and creativity. And we had the luxury to create kind of a safe environment, the two of us, where we could fully be without this kind of um, curiosity killing stress. Um, this is all, I know this is um, sometimes hard to do because you are of course in a stressful context and you can't kind of um, um, exclude uh, what's going on around and the pressure you are on and so on. However, somehow, and, and we share also some um, practical things you can do somehow you need to um, kind of keep keep the stress away and um, calm yourself down 
have the self-awareness to know what's triggering you, what's your inner state and so on. And no techniques, like for example, simple things, deep breathing, um, to put yourself in another exploration mode again. Yeah. And, you know, one of the other things is that you know, Caroline and I are both still, even as we were writing this book, running our own businesses, busy in our lives. Caroline has a large family that she's also taking care of. And so in a way, this work that we did together was like a little special treat that we would get to do on top of everything else. So it wasn't, it wasn't our full-time job. We did it in addition to our full-time lives and our full-time work. And it maybe that made it extra special because it was something we chose to do. No one asked us to write this book. No one asked us to collaborate together. We felt really compelled to do this work. And I think, you know, for any entrepreneur, generally an entrepreneur, yes, they have the pressures of investors and time to market and all of these things, but generally also they're really passionate about what they're doing. That's the reason and they became entrepreneurs. It's the reason we each started our own small businesses. And so I think to remember, like, why are you doing this work? Why is it important to you? And to come back to that why and ground yourself in it. I think for us, you know, working on this book on the side of everything else, you know, Caroline was often up till midnight working with me in my business hours because we're nine hours apart. But it was because she wanted to do this work and I wanted to do this work. And I think that's something to remember is that, the, you know, what's the why and what's the, the passion and the, the value behind what you're delivering. We hope that everyone who listens to this will be curious to explore our book and they can find it on our website, thepsychologicalsafetyplaybook.com. So you can get the retailer links there, but there's also some free material that'll get you started and give you a taste of what's in the book. We have a sample chapter and we have some free downloads there. You can sign up for our mailing list if you're interested in staying in touch with what we're up to and what's next. And that's all on the website. We also are both really active on LinkedIn and we love to connect with people. We love to hear how you're using the materials, what you're struggling with, what you'd like to know more about. So it's just Minette Norman and Caroline Helbig, both on LinkedIn. and we. We'd love to hear from anyone, your reactions, your thoughts, your questions, and your ideas for what more we might cover. 21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskarik. Imagine a space where triumphs, trials, and tales of entrepreneurship come alive. Welcome to the 21st Century Entrepreneurship Podcast. A Gold Awarded Journey, hosted by Martin Piskorik. Connecting with listeners in 95 countries and ranking in the top 0.5% of all podcasts. Join our exclusive community, elevate your perspective, and embark on the path to success.